Good morning, everyone. Some time ago, I set myself a challenge, and today I have come to fulfill it. As you know, on the last few months, I have been studying and making videos about the prehistory of Japan, the Stone Period, Paleolithic Japan, and the Ceramic Period, Jomon. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that, that I like most is to complement the study with entertaining media. It doesn't need to be perfect, it doesn't need to be particularly accurate, it just needs to entertain. This is because if, I've, if I have already studied, I'm bound to notice something that's very wrong. The aim is to associate images, stories and good memories with whatever I have already studied, so that I can remember my studies for many, many years to come. I was there for species when my first, re my first search revealed that there were no manga whose setting was the Japanese prehistory. Because, in fact, I had already bought, uh, I had already bought a manga called The Dawn of Japanese Culture, so I knew they existed. They were just apparently very hard to find. And that's where the challenge came from. I wanted to find all manga whose story took place at that time. The manga I found can be divided into several categories. Those whose setting imitates spare history, but that take place in a fantastic world or in a post-apocalyptic world. Those that take place in prehistoric times, but in places other than, other than Japan. Those that take place in prehistoric times, but in an undetermined location. And finally, those that take place in Japan during prehistoric times. And those in turn can be divided into those whose main purpose is to entertain, having no educational value, and those whose main purpose is to teach, targeting young people and children. There aren't many manga in this subcategory, but I wasn't expecting to find so many educational manga. At the same time, it makes some sense given the popularity of the Jomon and even the Paleolithic cultures in Japan. These manga, however, come with a catch. You can only find them in Japanese. There isn't enough worldwide interest to justify the release of official translations, and not even the navigators of the Seven Seas have bothered to make a fan translation. Although the target audience for this manga is young people, this doesn't necessarily mean that they are easy to read. On the contrary, they are rather complicated and well beyond my level of understanding of Japanese. But a, but a challenge is a challenge, and here I am to tell you what I thought of the first pages of each of these manga. Let's start with History of Japan, the Dawn of Japanese Culture. Nihon no Hekichi, Nipponbuka no Akebono. And if you think I read this title properly the first time, um. Thanks for the trust, even though I'm a complete stranger to you, but I'm sorry to tell you that I read Nihon Bunku instead of Nippon Bunka. I can't even read the title properly. This is going to be such a pain in the ass. <laughs> the book begins by presenting some theory in the first few pages, facts and curiosities about the eras from the Paleolithic, Kyuzeki Jidai, to the Kofun era, Kofun Jidai. These first two pages overview the main Japanese ruins, Izeki, this is the archaeological sites of Fune, Sanamairuyama, Minatogawa, among others. We are then presented with a sort of summary of the various periods, Paleolithic, Jomon, Yaoi and Kofun. This is followed by a section introducing the main characters of the stories to come. Each period has its own story and set of characters. We are only going to focus on the first two stories. In the Paleolithic chapter, the, there are three important characters. Riku, a young boy who is the main character, his father, Kabuto, and Sora, a woman who plays an important role in Riku's life, even though they have no blood ties with each other. In the Jomon era chapter, three more characters play a major role. Ugui, a teenage boy who is the main character, his younger brother Medjina, and Iguza, an old man who is a role model for Ugui. The first story begins with a moment when Tadahiro Aizawa discovered a stone tip in the layers of red clay in what is now the city of Midori. It is thanks to this discovery that it is known that there was a Paleolithic period. Until then, it was thought that Japan's history began in the Jomon period. 
that the hero leads the stone tip to get a better look at it in the sunlight and wonders how the people who created that tool lived. And that's when we, the readers, are transported back in time to the Paleolithic era, where a group of about 15 Paleolithic people are preparing to set up camp. Led by Kabuto, the head of the group, the men organize themselves to hunt, and one woman gathers the others to build the shelters. Riku brags about the praise that he's going to hunt, but is quickly reprimanded by his father, Chief Kabuto, which orders him to go and get her nuts with Sora and Umi, because he's still too young. Sora and Umi set off to get their nuts, but soon realized that Riku is missing. At this point, I was afraid that Riku was going to do something incredibly stupid, like put himself in danger or get in the way of the adult's hunt, but Sora and Umi find him shipping away at the rock to create his own spear. Once again, Riku is told to go and collect nuts. During the gathering, Sora scolds Riku, explaining to him that looking for food is not a game. Just then, however, the small group comes across a giant Yabe deer. Sora orders Riku to go and call the hunters, but Riku wants to hunt it himself. Sora tries to reason with him, because the risk is too great. If they don't hunt a prey soon, they will start to starve. If Riku tries and fails, you'll be putting the lives of the weak and the young at risk, including Umi, the little girl who is with them. Riku, stubborn as only a child can be, insists on chasing the deer, but luckily at that moment the deer moves away, and this leads to something good, because it, en it ends up guiding them to a lake, where a multitude of animals are betting and quenching their thirst, including a herd of deer and elephants. Back at camp, the hunting party is back and they arrived empty-handed. The atmosphere is tense. Riku, Sora and Umi rush in to report the discovery of the lake. Kabuto asks Riku to lead the group and authorizes him to take part in the hunt as well. Confronted with his first prey, a large elephant, Riku feels afraid, but remembers Sora's word, how crucial a catch is at that moment, and sets off. The sun sets on the camp and everyone participates in the dismemberment and processing of the elephant, happy to be able to survive a little longer. Riku, Umi and Sora all eat meat that has been wrapped in leaves and steam on hot stones. If I had tried to hunt a deer alone and failed, I wouldn't be eating such delicious meat right now, he admits. He then confesses that during the elephant hunt he felt afraid, but that the prospect of starving to death was even more frightening. He now realizes that hunting and living are not just a joke. The story ends with everyone gathered around the campfire under a starry sky, and Riku's spear made of translucent obsidian reflecting the stars. I like the story, it was very easy to read, and like some of the opening pages, and the use of simple language allowed me to learn new words, such as emono, which means prey, and kinomi, which means nuts. The fact that the plot was simple also meant that there were no misunderstandings. But I feel that later stories might become more complicated, with the hierarchies and complex social relationships emerging. Fortunately, for now, I only need to read one more, about the Jomon period, and it shouldn't be much more complicated than this one. The second chapter begins by showing us how nature has changed with the arrival of the Jomon period, the abundance of small animals such as wild boar, rabbits and tanukis. A group of women are picking fruit and in the distance, on the water, a young man is standing in a canoe trying to fish. This young man is the main character, Ugui. He sees a big fish and tries to eat it with his harpoon, but the fish knocks over the canoe and Ugui falls into the water, prompting jocular comments from other fishermen. The village where Ugui lives is a coastal village. An old man sews a fishing net, children play with dogs, villagers dry fish and build ceramic pots. You can see canoes stored along the shore and pit houses. It's a very different scene from the previous story. That night, Ugui is given a task. His parents want him to travel to a village beyond the mountains and make an exchange, dried fish and salt for meat and obsidian. Ugui has already traveled this road with his father, but this time he has to go alone because his father hurt his leg fishing. When Mejina, Ugui's younger brother, complains that he has never had a chance to see the other village, his father tells him that he can go with his brother. Ugui is nervous but tries to hide it. The next morning, the two boys are ready to leave, so that they wouldn't get hurt on the journey, their mother broke a dog's leg. You can learn more about this tradition in this video. 
Along the way, Medina asked his brother when he visited the other village, and he replies that it was two years ago, and that when he returned, his teeth were pulled out in the coming of age ritual. Medina will also go through the ritual after another three years. The journey goes smoothly. We can see the two brothers gathering fruit, fishing, eating around the fire, until one night a fox approaches the place where they are sleeping and steals their supplies, the dried fish and salt they were going to use for the bartering. Left with no choice, the, the two boys keep going. Before they reach the village, they pass a plantation of, es, of chestnut trees, an indication of the size of the camp. This camp is the famous Sana Maruyama, and, desolate, the two children stroll through the large market, where many people are doing business. When they arrive at the agreed location, they are informed by an elderly woman that the people they are looking for left that morning and won't be back anytime soon. She then invites them for a meal. While they eat, the old woman learns about the two boys' situation and takes pity on them. She even wants to offer them some dried meat and nuts, but her husband, Iguza, rebukes her, saying that they can't afford that. They will let the boys stay overnight in their shelter and feed them, but no more than that. The boys ask what they can do to help in gratitude, and the couple's daughter says she will make pottery. The two boys offer to help her, but Iguza wants Ugui to help him hunt instead. Ugui gets nervous, but follows the old man and Toby, his dog, into the forest. Ugui admits that he's no good at hunting or fishing, and that he doesn't really seem to be able to do anything properly. Iguza tells him that he's already a splendid adult, because he was able to bring his brother to the village safe and sound, and that his father, by entrusting him with the care of Medina, shows how much trust he has in his son. He then offers him an arrow and motivates him. Meanwhile, the elderly couple's daughter teaches Medina and the reader how to make a ceramic vase and bake acorn cookies. When Ugui comes back from hunting, he brings a pheasant that he has killed himself. Iguza proposes exchanging the pheasant for two sacks, one with dried wild boar meat and the other with nuts. When it's time for the brothers to leave, Iguza sees them off. Ugui and Medina discover that it was he and his wife who started planting the chestnut trees around the village, which now serve as a source of food and building material. At the time, they were mocked for their initiative. Iguza teaches the boys that survival is a question of wisdom and encourages Ugui to innovate in his own village. Over the years, Ugui becomes responsible for many inventions that make life easier for the villagers, such as the ardent asphalt arrowhead and the rotating harpoon head, and make him respected even by those who use it to mock him. Ugui and Medina return to Sana Mayuruyama, Ugui because he wants to show Iguza the harpoon he invented, and Medina because he wants to show that he has gone through the ritual of removing his teeth. When they arrive at the village, however, they find a tense atmosphere. Iguzu has died and is being buried. Later, Ugui and Medina attend a, a festival with Kaya, Iguzu's wife. The purpose of the festival is to honor the souls of the dead animals of the mountain. The story ends with Ugui thinking about Iguza and how he wishes he was still around to attend the festival with them and also to show him the harpoon he invented. I really enjoyed the story. I thought Ugui was a more likable protagonist than Riku, but it's unfair to compare them since Ugui is older than Riku and therefore more mature and responsible from the start. But of course the best character is Iguzu who plays the role of mentor in the protagonist's life. It's a stereotype, yes, but they all are. And they work very well in a story that is so simple. And the way bits of theory are intertwined with the narration is very well done. If I hadn't studied all that, I would have found it quite interesting. I thought, on the other hand, those parts are a bit difficult to understand, so it's a good thing I had prior knowledge on the topics. And these are the two prehistoric tales that can be found in the down of Japanese culture. I've talked for quite a while, but that's because this was the manga I actually bought, so I have access to all of it. My thoughts on the next ones will be much more succinct, because I only have access to a few pages, a preview. This is why the vi this video is called First Impressions. This next one is entitled Gaken Manga Nihon no Hekichi Nihon no Akebono, which means Educative Manga History of Japan, The Down of Japan. Yes, I know what you're thinking, and yes, the title of this manga are all very similar. The story begins with the discovery of the Omori Shell Mound by American zoologist Edward S. Morse during a train journey, 
an event that led to the discovery of the Jomon period. Morse is portrayed as an eccentric scientist and a strange individual, possibly related to the fact that he was a foreigner, but also as someone who was very enthusiastic and passionate. Arriving in Tokyo, Morse asks permission to excavate the shell mounds with his students. With care, Morse and his students begin their excavations and find not only shells but also animal bones. At one point, a student finds a piece of pottery, and human bones soon follow. Morse presents his findings, which include the fragments of pottery marked by rope, and the page ends with a reference to, to a building that was erected to commemorate the event. However, we can say that all this was just a kind of introduction, because the real story, with the characters from the Jomon period, begins on the next page where a boy seizes a tanuki with a spear. The tanuki, however, tricks the boy by hiding in a bush and causing him to fall down a ravine. His sister comes to his aid with a rope and suggests that he should try hunting with a bow and arrows, which is much better than running after prey. The reference to the bow and the arrow actually places the story in the Jomon era, because in the Paleolithic these weapons didn't exist. The two children then notice a pack of wild boars, but I never found out if the hunt is successful or not, because it's at this point that the preview pages run out. In conclusion, here are my first impressions. In terms of dialogues within the story itself, this manga compared to the previous one seems to have more difficult ones, but this one is definitely easier to read when it comes to supplementary information about the era, which is very sparse and usually appears outside the comic, as footnotes, rather than being included inside the story. The other one I found very accessible as far as the story was concerned, but whenever more academic parts came up, it was as if my head split in half. The biggest problem with this manga is that the Furigana characters that appear alongside the kanji are so small that they are almost unreadable even at maximum zoom, which I will admit it's a bit annoying. But I did learn some cool words, like zoology, whose kanji can be translated as study of the things that move, which I found very funny, as in it makes sense. I also noticed that this manga has a more comedic tone than the previous one with expressions like this and this and scenes like this and this. So if that's more your style, keep this one in mind. The next manga is entitled Nio no Hekichi Kino no Ashitawa, that is something like History of Japan, Tomorrow is Yesterday which I suppose alludes to that one saying that goes know the past to predict the future or something like that. I don't know the exact words, but you probably know what saying I am talking about. This manga is aimed at elementary school children and the first volumes cover the eras from the Paleolithic period to the Nara period. It even has some explanations on how to use it as study material. Either way, the story begins in April, during the Sakura season. A boy, Fumiki, philosophizes about the way the wind blows the curtains of flower petals and about what can be seen beyond these curtains. But his ramblings are overheard by his classmate, Koyomi Inomoto. Talk about awkward. We squeak to point out that Fumiki writes very good compositions and poems, and like her, because Fumiki spends class breaks reading at the back of the school building. The two children don't notice, but the woman is passing by and takes an interest in the conversation. Koyomi says goodbye, asking him to show her something he has written next time. Fumiki is delighted that Koyomi knows his name, since he transferred in the middle of the semester and doesn't talk much to his classmates. The woman who saw Fumiki and Koyomi talking approaches Fumiki, who immediately gets ready to set off a security alarm he has with him. The woman explains that she has created a virtual time travel system and wants Fumiki to try it out. Fumiki, now is the time. Set off that alarm. Fumiki refuses, obviously, and then the woman reveals that her name is Ayano Inamoto and that she is Koyomi's aunt. Due to circumstances, which are not specified, Ayano and Koyomi live alone together. The plan is for Koyomi to try out the device, but Ayano explains that she also needs data from a male subject for her study. 
Honestly, if this were any other kind of manga, this would make for a great start to horror story. Fumiki is approached in the street by an unfamiliar woman, dressed in a lab coat, who tries to convince him to take part in an experiment, adding that the girl he likes is also going to take part just to entice him. And let me remind you that she witnessed the two of them talking earlier. Anyway, let's go back to the story. This is just my twisted mind at work. Ayano takes Fumiki to the Inomoto Research Institute and the two are greeted by Koyomi, who is happy to hear that Fumiki is going to be joining her on the voyage to the past. Ayano explains that the virtual reality she has created consists of a device that allows you to practically travel back in time because you can see, feel and act as if you were in the real world. Fumiki wonders if, she, if he should trust Ayano and if the experiment won't be dangerous. I like this kid more and more. He's more reasonable than 90% of the shonen protagonists. The problem is that he says this out loud and Koyomi hastens to assure him that Ayano is a top scientist, known as the Eastern Witch, which is not at all comforting by the way. She then adds that she can go alone if Umiki isn't comfor comfortable with the idea, but that she will be very lonely. This poor kid never had a chance to say no, did he? And so the two children set off on a simulation of Japan 20,000 years ago. To guide them, they have a little fairy with the voice of Ayano. The fairy explains that the shape of Japan has changed over the years due to the movement of tectonic plates. Fumiki and Koyomi observe the fauna typical of the era and witness the Paleolithic people's failed hunt for an elephant. Fumiki picks up the spear that one of the hunters has dropped and is promptly scolded by the fairy for trying to touch the tip, because in the simulated universe it is possible to feel pain. The fairy explains that the tip of the spear is made of volcanic obsidian and is therefore very sharp. Fumiki and Koyomi decide to go in search of the primitives they have spotted from afar, and to find them they deduce that they must find a source of water because the people of the time couldn't live very far from rivers, lakes or ponds, from where they obtained not only fresh water, but also food. And this is where the manga ends. I'm not going to lie, I ended up more invested in the story than I expected. Of all the three manga we have seen, this is undoubtedly the one with the most tropes. The introverted protagonist, the love interest, school age characters, time travel of sorts, a mascot. I'm not saying any of these things is bad, by the way. Uh, I'm just conveying the vibe of this manga. Now let's move on to the next one. This manga is very similar to the first, in the sense that we have three main characters in a story involving the Paleolithic period and three main characters in a story involving the Jomon period. But this time I only have access to a small part of the first story, which involves a hunter and his two children, Ayata, a boy who looks up to his father, and Saki, Ayata's younger sister. The story begins with an exposition on how mankind arose and where, and also on how primitive men arrived in the archipelago of Japan during the last ice age. A group of around 12 men and women from the Paleolithic period are in the process of moving, and among them is one of the characters in this story. Saki. The child wonders how much longer they have to walk and complains of being tired. As she looks around, she notices her brother's absence and calls out to him. Ayata emerges from the bushes with branches stuck on his head and scares her. Their father warns them that they can get lost from the group by playing and carries them one on each shoulder. Along the way, the children and their father talk about the importance of hunting and show their admiration for their father's abilities. And now I want to show you something that is the perfect example for why using Google Translate in Japan might not be the best of ideas. And for the Portuguese and Brazilians in the audience, it gets even wilder. I was hesitant to show this on YouTube, but I thought it was hilarious, so I couldn't help but bring you these gems. Anyway, the group of Paleolithic people arrive at the river and put down their belongings. Some begin to wash, while others talk about the recent scarcity of elephant herds, alluding to the extinction of the great fauna that occurred between the Paleolithic and the Jomon period. 
Ayate gets off his father's shoulder and starts running, followed by his sister. The two kids come across an old man called Genji, who is looking for an old campsite, which shows that some time ago, possibly months or even years, the group had been there. The preview pages end at the moment when the old man and the two children find the place where the old tent was set up. I don't have much to say about this one because the sample is pretty short. I think one thing I can comment on is on how easy it is to read. Probably the easiest of all of we have seen so far. Finally, the last manga we are going to see today is entitled Nihon no Akebono. Yes, again, I will never forget the word Akebono no matter how long I live. The first chapter, the one we have access to thanks to the sample, is called A Feast of Nauman Elephants, which immediately places us in the Paleolithic period. The chapter begins by telling the story of the herds using the analogy of the clock, which places important events that have taken place from the birth of the herd to the present day in a 24-hour period, giving us an idea on how recent life, both human life and life itself, is. If you consider the moment zero to be the appearance of the planet, midnight, then it turns out that the Cambrian period only occurred at 9 and 24 pm, the dominion of the dinosaurs at 11 29 pm, the formation of the Japanese archipelago at 11 54 pm, the appearance of the hominids in Africa at 23 hours 57 minutes and 43 seconds, and the appearance of Homo sapiens at 23 hours 59 minutes and 56 seconds. Considering today as midnight, the end of the 24 hour period, the history of Japan began only 0.75 seconds ago. And then again, the manga tells the story of how in the last ice age, the sea level was lower and how this allowed Homo sapiens to migrate to the Japanese archipelago in pursuit of prey. At the entrance to a cave, a group of men are preparing for a hunt by making weapons, including a spear studded with microliths. Before leaving, one of them asks his partner where their son, Ken, is, and the woman replies that he must be depressed because his father did not allow him to join them on the hunt, a plot very similar to that of the first story we saw. But the real reason behind Ken's disappearance is that the boy made the decision to follow the hunting party in secret. Not surprisingly, he got lost and only found the adults again when he heard the sound of an human elephant being hunted. Ken witnessed the hunt, including the moment when his father was pushed to the ground by the elephant at the time when the hunters thought it was subdued. The elephant then starts running towards Ken, who is paralyzed with terror, and is only not it because the animal submerges in the wetland, which allows the man to finally kill it. With all his patience, more than I would have, the father approaches his son and tries to make him understand what has happened and how hunting large prey can cost lives, which almost happened right there. And the little brat yells at his father before running off. This is one of those kids who is a perfect example of a contraceptive method, I'm telling you. Ken is still sulking when night falls and everyone is eating around the campfire. His father tries to offer him a piece of meat and announces that the next day he will accompany him to the nearby camp to exchange meat for obsidian. After the exchange, the father offers Ken an obsidian for the boy to make his own spear and promises him that he will take part in the next end, because Ken can go on being treated like a child forever. Which makes sense, but even so, in the end, the brat got what he wanted despite having put everyone in danger earlier. Ken has just finished building the spear when a girl, perhaps a sister or a friend, walks past him carrying a pile of twigs in her arms. When Ken tells her that he is going hunting, the girl replies that he can't because he's a child. So Ken decides to prove to the girl that he can hunt something big and bring back the meat. Alone. When he comes across a giant deer, he decides to lunge right at it, without even a plan. Look, I know he's a kid and I'm trying to root for him, but it's starting to get really hard. I'm practically a team deer at this point. Predictably, the deer knocks Ken over and the spear falls down a cliff. The only reason the boy isn't killed is because the adults appear at that moment and kill the deer. 
At least this time, Ken hugs his father and apologizes for what he has done. The father then reveals that he too, as a child, tried to hunt alone. Now I understand whom he took after. Thousands of years later, in 1946, Tadahira Aizawa found a piece of obsidian, precisely the tip of the spear that Ken dropped while trying to hunt a deer. Tadahiro studies the history of the area and continues to dig up stone tools for three years, finally presenting his findings to an archaeologist, Sozuke Serizawa, since Tadahiro was only an enthusiast. Sherezawa confirms that Tadahiro's discovery proves that people existed in Japan during the Paleolithic period. The story ends with this event that led to the rewriting of Japan's history. I will admit, out of the five, this one was the one that I liked the least. Because this is exactly the type of plot I feared the first story was going to have. One of my pet peeves is bratty characters, especially when they are children. I don't mind uh, bratty characters. I don't mind bratty characters when they have other redeeming qualities, like when they are funny or when they are smart. But Ken is just your stereotypical bratty kid, with nothing going on for him besides that. I like that they tied the loss of the spear with Tadairu's discovery thought. I thought that was cool. And that will be all for today, because I think the video is already turning out a bit too long. I still have manga left to I still have some manga left to see, but I will leave that to a part two. I hope you enjoyed the video, even though the topic is a bit niche. I like a good challenge, so I set myself this one. I don't like all challenges. I don't like nothing that involves like pain or humiliation, for example. You probably know what challenges I'm talking about. You've probably seen a good share of those. But yeah, feel free to share if you have any suggestions. It doesn't even have to be academic. It can just be it can just be a fun or random challenge. I know the vibe of my channel is serious and educational, but I'm not opposed to trying new things from time to time. I will I will leave you now. Hope to see you again. See you later.